lies, the part of extra history where we confess our falsehoods, uh, own up to the mistakes we made, and relate all the incredible historical anecdotes that simply couldn't make it into the series. Um, first off, I want to thank all the patrons for voting this one in. This is a series I'd hoped to do basically since we conceived of extra history, because when I was first studying Roman history, this was one of the most difficult things for me to keep straight. And I wanted to make the primer I wish I always had, right? And so just th thank you again for voting on this one, and thank you everybody for watching. It was amazingly awesome to see the comments and just the love for super esoteric, pretty dry history of early Christian theology. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Um, oh, leads me nicely to the next point. The first thing we got to talk about in terms of lies is why no Gnosticism? Clearly, the Gnostic movement is this huge, important early schism. So, why didn't we touch on it? Well, when I was constructing the art for these episodes, I realized that I wanted them to give context to history and to serve as the sort of primer I talked about. I wanted them to talk about religion, but not in isolation. Instead, as a part of this living history of who we are, as a part of what shaped us and what brought us to where we are today. As such, I want to talk about the history of religion in the context of the societies it was taking place in. I wanted to make a sort of easily referenceable guide that we can always point to when studying a specific period or culture. So these episodes are the companion to the Roman Empire. As we're discussing the history of later Rome, we can always point back to these and say, here's a more in-depth look at some of the religious ideas that we've only mentioned here in passing, uh, which it sort of leads me right back to Gnosticism. The Gnostic movement had a much greater impact on Persia than it did on Rome, and is much more intimately tied with Persian politics and Persian history than it is with that of Rome. So the plan is to do an episode on Gnosticism right before, if I get things together, or right after we do a series on the Persian Empire. Oh, and the same is true for Iconoclasm or the Great Schism. They'll be covered in their own micro-series, just one or two episode chunks that can serve as a companion for their periods when we get there. And I really, I mean, I hope we get to do this for Buddhism and Islam and all the other major religions as well. I think we need to do this for not just Christianity. But anyway, I've spent far too much time talking about the organizational structure of this, probably because I've spent far too much time thinking about how I was going to organize it. Uh, but let's get to the episodes themselves because there's so much awesomeness in this. Uh, episode one. First off, I just wanted to say it was amazing and a bunch of you guys pointed out the sort of theological underpinnings for Paul's reasoning for getting rid of circumcision. It's important and it's something I should have put in. A uh, short version is that one of the big questions that split the early Christian community is whether they were still Jews. Uh, <laughs> this is going to be a little simplified uh, or actually way, way, way simplified. but. In Judaism, uh, the way to reach salvation is sort of to follow the Mosaic laws. But Paul's whole idea of the Christ was that his sacrifice wiped away all sins. And so to believe in his sacrifice was sufficient to be saved. So Christians no longer had to follow the Mosaic laws, one of which, which was circumcision. And I have absolutely no doubts that he believed in this doctrine and uh, sort of thought about things this way. But Paul's also probably the guy most responsible to, for sort of pushing the church to grow and become more than just a regional sect. He wanted to see it just reach the corners of the globe. And there's enough accounts of Romans being wigged out by the idea of circumcision that I'm personally pretty convinced that he knew he had to make a bigger deal out of getting rid of circumcision than, say, the prohibitions against necromancy. And some of you felt that it was weird that people who might be willing to risk their lives to be Christians might be creeped out by adult circumcision. But we live in a weird world, and there's a lot of guys who, if you say to them, uh, there's a chance you might die for this great noble thing we want you to be a part of. 
uh, there's a lot of guys who are foolhardy enough to say, yeah, sure, sign me up, right? I'm willing to take that risk. But if you then add, oh, and by the way, we are 100% gonna cut off part of your penis to do it, uh, that actually puts a break on things a bit. Uh, oh, and since I'm talking about episode one, I should probably mention that, especially for this early period, almost all the sources we have are basically from the winning side. Uh, as Christianity was a tiny religious sect in a world with thousands of religious sects at the time, uh, the only people writing about it were the very people sort of embroiled in these debates. Nobody else was really taking notice. And so of those, the documents that survived and have been passed down to us are mostly from the sides that won. And so that's just something to keep in mind as we look at these things. I don't think we'll ever know absolutely everything that's going to go on. Oh, and it was rad to see someone mention that the, our Grim Reaper was anachronistic. It totally is. Uh, I thought that was great. Uh, and Milvian Bridge. Can you imagine what the world would be like if the Milvian Bridge went differently? Uh, I'm gonna try and keep myself not from talking about it a bunch here because I know when we get to Constantine, I'm inevitably just gonna go off and talk about it a ton. But seriously, like, I can't even deal with it. Uh, Every time I try and think about it, I can't even fathom what the world would look like if this one Roman battle, out of the thousands of Roman battles, had gone differently. Uh, that's not to say that others didn't have an enormous effect on the world, but like, in my mind, I, every once in a while, for a lark, try and put together my list of top 10 turning points in human history, and Milvian basically always makes a list. So, yeah, I'll keep quiet on and get to episode two, but it's just one of these things that boggles my mind to think about how much rest on this one moment. Uh, so, oh, no, no, I'm totally not done. I'm totally gonna use that to jump to talk about Constantine's Christianity, because this is one of those highly debated topics in history uh, was Constantine really a Christian? Was he just using them for political purposes? Did he really have a vision? Uh, well, here's my take on things. And it's just my take because without some radical new piece of evidence showing up, I'm not sure we'll ever know these things exactly. Uh, and I'll give you a spoiler up front, right? Do I think that Constantine was a Christian? Yes. Uh, at least, I certainly think that he thought of himself as a Christian. <laughs> not 100% sure he knew what he was getting into, or exactly the minutia of what Christianity was when he was converted. Uh, but then again, as we saw, maybe nobody totally knew exactly what being Christian meant then. Um, but here's what we do know, right? Constantine always liked to associate himself with Sol Invictus, the unconquerable sun. It's on his coins, it's on his architecture, everywhere. Uh, he even invoked it when he made his famous decree about Sunday being a day of rest. And uh, Sol Invictus was a monotheistic deity, right? Uh, so Constantine was a monotheist from pretty early on. We know that absolutely. Uh, in some ways, I think he liked the idea of one emperor, one god. I also think he saw it as an easier way to manage an empire sort of under one god rather than to worry about accidentally stepping on the toes of one of a thousand different cults that Rome had going on. Uh, but here's where it gets muddy, because there are some modern historians who claim that he was actually always a follower of Sol Invictus and never really converted, and that later Christian writers just spun a lot of his worship of Sol Invictus as the worship of the Christian God, because they actually fit in unbelievably nicely, right? Sunday is one example. Uh, the feast of the birth of Sol Invictus just happens also to be Christmas. And there's all these parallels, right? On and on and on. Uh, and constantly did leave inscriptions talking about the God, um, but even immediately after his battle at the Milvian Bridge, he didn't start identifying those inscriptions which God the God was. Um, and even at Milvian Bridge, one of the two accounts we have of his vision says he had it by looking into the sun. But given that we have his labarum with the Cairo and his later acts, I think it goes way too far to say that Constantine wasn't a Christian. 
I think he was a Roman and an emperor first. I think he was clever enough of a guy to realize that uh, Milvian Bridge was going to be the fight of his life, and he might be able to give his men a little bit more morale by having a vision and then have them paint on their shields this magical sign that he'd seen floating around and tell them it was going to protect them and make them conquer. Uh, but I also, I think he also uh, saw it as totally appropriate to wait till the end of his life, which wasn't actually uncommon at the time, to be baptized so he could spend his whole life sort of committing the sins an emperor had to commit to run the empire before getting them all washed away at the last minute and getting that uh, get out of hell free card. But I do think within that understanding, within how he could conceptualize Christianity as an emperor and the leader of Rome, I do think he was a Christian. And uh, in his own way, in service to the empire, uh, a, a actually kind of devout one. Uh, sorry, I find Constantine this fascinating, really complex character, but I'm, I'm burning daylight, and I know that, and I'm going to tear on because I could talk about him for a long time. Hopefully someday we will. Uh, but I think I can blaze through most of the rest of the episode, too. So when I said uh, Donatus was elected right after um, Sil Sicilian, I meant soon after. There's actually another guy who dies, like, days after he's elected before he does anything, and they immediately elect Donatus after him. So there is technically a guy in there. Uh, oh, and where do you think our English word for traitor comes from? Traditories. I think it's rad. Uh, oh, and as far as Christians being thrown to the lions, some people mentioned they had heard that this was a myth. My understanding is that it isn't a myth. There are actually a few ancient accounts of this happening, just not in the Colosseum. But it's likely that later writers sort of way inflated the numbers and made it seem like this was so much more prevalent than it was. I mean, just like how in the United States, we, where capital punishment is used, we have uh, lethal injection and the electric chair, Romans had a bunch of different methods of execution, and uh, one of which was um, Demnato ad Bestia, which was being thrown to the beasts. And when Christianity was a capital crime, it's my guess that in some parts of the empire, that happened to be the punishment they used. Oh, and Walpole moment! Uh, when I was researching this, I guess I look up Walpole a lot, uh, because one of the first things I found was a letter from Thomas Gray to Horace Walpole relating the very untrue story that the Colosseum, like the, the Rome in Rome Colosseum, was built for uh, Christians to fight beasts in. Uh, anyway, on to episode three. First off, 318 bishops probably wasn't the real number. Uh, 318 has significance in Christianity as a reference to John 318, a bunch of other stuff. So most of the sources I've read said it was probably close to that number and that got nudged a little bit to make it more symbolic, but uh, no one actually knows what the real number is, so that's what everybody goes with. Oh, next, eye patches. Yeah, so this was really a Christian Avengers movie, right? These guys who got together were like a clerical super team. Uh, a huge amount of them were famous martyrs who had survived persecutions. Uh, because you have to remember, that was less than a lifetime ago. So some of these guys are missing eyes, other of them are missing limbs because they've been persecuted for the faith, and we wanted to include that. And uh, when you read about these guys, you hear how some of them had all sorts of, like, the power to raise the dead or turn back evil. So I can see how this would be exciting and sort of magical back in the day. Like, it was kind of funny to me how it read almost like the introduction to a comic book in this great way. Uh, as far as the eye patches changing sides occasionally, tragically, that's the magic of flipping a character in Flash and not something they could actually do. Uh, oh, and according to tradition, during the Council of Nicaea, St. Nicholas, yes, Santa Claus, punched Arius in the face. Uh, I just, I don't know if that's actually true, but I read it enough that I had to talk about it. Uh, but on to episode four. Here I wanted to talk about uh, Theodosius and Cyril and the meaning of Monophysite. First off, Theodosius is not a stellar emperor. I think a better empire emperor could have avoided this entirely. Upon listening to the episode again, I think I made it sound a little bit like he got stuck with this problem, but it's more that like he did nothing to avoid it. Uh, 
And Cyril, he's not a great guy. He does a lot of exiling Jews and using monks as a militia. There was just no space to put that in in the episode. Uh, yeah, so on to the big one, Monophysites. There's actually a ton of other related splinter views that are similar, but not the same to Monophysitism, such as the Myophysites, who, were, uh, who are still important today, actually. Most of the historical text I read, though, lumped them together as Monophysites when dealing with what's known as the Monophysite controversy. And to me, uh, perhaps more importantly, their opponents, uh, the opponents of monophysitism and the opponents of these splinter groups will just lump them all together and refer to them as monophysites. So you hear Chalcedonians calling myophysites monophysites in historical texts. So I had to make a choice between being sort of more specific and more accurately representing monophysitism or using it the way that I saw most of the historical texts use it. And thus, uh, I thought it would be more useful to refer to it that way be for students of history. And so I chose the latter. Uh, but I'm not 100% comfortable with that, just leaving it there. So know that if you want to dig in, there's a lot more here. Uh, and that one's a bit of an over large generalization. Uh, oh, and to demonstrate how big of a deal this split is and how some of these things that may seem trivial outside of the faith, uh, are actually still with us, right? It wasn't until 1994, like 20 years ago, that the Assyrian church and the Catholic church repaired the divide that happened at Ephesus and agreed that it was okay for Assyrians to refer to Mary by saying, mother of Christ, our God and savior, and Catholics to say, mother of God, and also the mother of Christ, without deciding that they were meaning radically Bible-altering differently different things, right? Some of this is starting to heal, but we're still, we're still feeling the waves and consequences of this. But I just wanted to thank you all again for hanging out and being so engaged and respectful with this. I was actually really moved when I saw the comments and uh, sort of religion was being discussed in a civilized and meaningful way, like adults. You guys are awesome. Uh, and I think this is so important. I think it's just so vital that we can do this because as students of history, it's essential to those of us who are secular that we don't simply reject studying this incredible part of who we are, and that those of us who are of the faith uh, don't see every examination of the history of the faith as a critique, but rather as a way to help us understand how the faith has shaped us, um, and even when it's gone astray. Because there are many great and beautiful acts of kindness and charity that have come out of Christianity, as there are out of all major religions. But at the same time, like all major religions, there are moments of strife and moments of absurdity. And I feel like uh, we're big enough to own those, right? I think the better the faith is better for doing so. So, and that's that's exactly what I saw from all sides here, that there weren't sides. And that was amazing to me. So thank you again. Uh, you guys never cease to remind me why we do this. And so with that, I will leave you to enjoy the amazing music by the Kiners, which should be posted in a separate video by the time this one goes up. And uh, after this, we've got two one-off episodes, and then we dive right into the Opium Wars. Wars that uh, may not have been as large or destructive as many we've covered, but wars whose legacy nonetheless echoes resoundingly into the world of today. So, I will see you guys all next time. Take care, everybody.